Number one, Jesus is identical with God. What we're trying to figure out here in answering this question is what if it explicitly excludes the idea of other gods in heaven? If, if what we say doesn't match up with what we mean, then it really doesn't matter what we say. He was God and he was a man. It only really matters what we mean. Is Jesus God? Jesus God. Um, let me introduce the debaters uh, with the biographical information that uh, Harry gave me, and this is also posted on the apologetics.com website if you'd like to uh, look at that at a later time. Uh, first, uh, Robert Bowman uh, previously served as a researcher and editor for the Christian Research Institute, CRI the Atlanta Christian Apologetics Project, and also Watchman Fellowship. His service in those organizations included regular appearances for over a year on CRI's Bible Answer Man program. And uh, he hosted for over two years the um, Atlanta Christian Apologetics Project show. It's called Tooth Truth Talk Radio. Excuse me, I'll say that fast five times. Uh, on those programs, and uh, for five years he taught apologetics, cult studies, theology, and biblical studies at Luther Rice Seminary um, in Georgia. He currently teaches courses uh, for us at uh, Biola University uh, on the reliability of the scriptures, and, uh, and this is in our Christian apologetics program where Rob teaches for us uh, as an adjunct. Uh, he has authored uh, six books, including Why You Should Believe in the Trinity, and the Word Faith Controversy, and he has co-authored uh, two other books with Ken Boa. Uh, the titles of those are An Unchanging Faith in a Changing World and, um, uh, and a Christianity Today Award of Merit winner, uh, Faith Has Its Reasons, an Integrative Approach to Defending Christianity. Both books have received the uh, gold medallion. Greg Stafford, um, the other debater tonight, is a third generation Jehovah's Witness and an author of two highly acclaimed books on the teachings and history of the Jehovah's Witnesses and of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. So we are very privileged to have two highly qualified individuals to present their respective positions and I'm convinced that this is going to be a very good time uh, tonight and a, a very high level debate and we're looking forward to that. Now let me um, say a bit about what the purpose of the debate is. Why do we have debates and what do we hope to gain from them? Tonight we are in a kind of small way uh, participating in an age-old tradition of academic disputation. Um, if you study your history a little bit, if you look at the medieval universities, the so-called disputatio or disputation was an integral part of the educational process. And the advantages to this method is that it caused students to think through complex issues uh, and to give a defense for the positions that they held. It also provided um, an opportunity to bring opposing alternative viewpoints into much sharper relief than would otherwise be the case. Now, most of us are familiar with uh, Martin Luther, considered by many to be the father of the Protestant Reformation. And as most of us know, uh, a watershed event occurred on October 31st, 1517, when Luther posted his 95 theses uh, against the sale of indulgences. And in, in doing this, he, he posted these theses uh, on the door of the castle church at Wittenberg. Now, in, in nailing this document to the castle door, church door, he was not committing an act of vandalism. Uh, actually, the castle church door served as a bulletin board, uh, and Luther was simply doing a very common activity. He was posting theses, um, propositions, articles, uh, for uh, academic disputation. It was just part of the normal educational process at that time. And we know that from that event, we see it wasn't even the debate itself in that case, but merely the proposition set forth for debate that had a profound historical impact and literally turned the world upside down. Now, tonight, um, an academic, or I should say today, that is to say in our present age, uh, an academic disputation such as what we're doing here tonight 
is, is relatively uncommon. Um, certainly uh, universities uh, have their forensic you know, public speaking teams, and in fact, if I can put a plug for my own school, Biola University has a very fine forensics team which engages in debate. Uh, but in terms of academic debate being an integral part of the curriculum, um, that's really no longer the case. Um, and it is no longer required to get um, a college degree, whether it's bachelor's of arts degree or higher. And of course, those of us who have bachelor's degrees or, or other degrees beyond that even, may uh, take pause to realize just how much easier we have it compared to the somewhat uh, rough and ready method of education that people went through in the past um, compared to our medieval or renaissance counterparts because in those days one could attend classes uh, ad infinitum and never get out of the school. You literally had to argue your way out of the school and into the degree. And so uh, what we're going to be looking at here tonight is a little bit of a snapshot of what that educational process was like uh, as part of just the normal course of learning. And so this is um, a wonderful opportunity, and I hope we will see it that way, to in a small way kind of recapitulate um, classical education at its finest. And so just let me um, say in wrapping up these thoughts that in the form of what we're doing here, the form and the structure, we're certainly walking in some pretty big footsteps of some of the giant intellects of Western civilization. And my hope is that we will have the insight here tonight as we listen to the debaters debate their positions pro and con, that we will have the insight to discern the substance as well as the form um, in terms of the topic that's set before us tonight and especially because the debate here is about the Bible and what it teaches, um, my hope is that the truth of God's word would be displayed in its brilliant splendor and that we would gain discernment and knowledge as a result of this time here together. So that is my brief homily on why we are here. Um, let me move uh, quickly here and give you a um, statement of the format, how, how this evening is going to proceed. Um, of course, you, you all know by now that the topic of the debate is, is Jesus God examining the biblical evidence? That is the proposition that is being debated tonight. Is Jesus God examining the biblical evidence? And the format for the debate is going to begin with opening statements by each of the uh, debaters. Um, and uh, these opening statements will be 20 minutes each. Uh, the, this, um, the opening statements will be what we might call a positive presentation of their position. Um, Rob Bowman will go first, uh, and he will have 20 minutes to articulate why he believes that the Bible teaches uh, that Jesus is God. And his primary focus in that 20 minutes is not to critique other positions, or at least that's not the direct uh, purpose there. It's to set forth his affirmative reason for why he believes the Bible teaches the affirmative answer to the question before us and why he thinks that it, why he thinks that it does. Then after um, Rob Bowman has his 20 minutes, um, Greg Stafford will get 20 minutes to do the same thing. And of course what he will be doing is presenting uh, his reasons for why he believes that the Bible, according to Scripture, the teaching of the Bible, that Jesus is not God. And here again he's going to give his um, affirmative presentation for why he takes the, um, the negative on the, uh, if you follow that, uh, on the proposition before us. And, uh, and, and, and it, in, in all of these cases, whether it's the opening statements or at any other point, we're going to follow the um, timing guidelines very carefully and strictly, and I have a little timer that will make obnoxious noises if uh, we run out of time and they're still uh, talking. So, um, Then um, after, after the, uh, uh, they alternate with their opening statements, 20 minutes, 20 minutes, then we will move to a rebuttal phase. And the way the rebuttal phase is going to work is that um, Rob Bowman is going to present uh, challenges and criticisms 
uh, to the view that's presented by Greg Stafford. And he has 15 minutes to do that. And then, uh, as you would expect, we will flip the coin, and uh, Greg Stafford will have um, 15 minutes to do the same, to present challenges and criticisms to the view that Rob Bowman is uh, defending in this debate. Then we shall have a break uh, of 15 minutes, and uh, this will uh, give you an opportunity to write out questions for the debaters to answer in the Q&A session that is going to come later. Um, and I'll give you a little more information on that uh, uh, right as I'm about ready to dismiss you for the, um, for the break. But uh, the, the, the basic point is that uh, you, if you have questions for the debaters, you will address your question to a specific debater. I have a question for Rob Bowman. Please say that, answer this or that. I have a question for Greg Stafford. Write out your question. Uh, you'll do that toward the beginning of the break, and then um, I'll be... Uh, we'll collect those, the ushers will collect those, and I'll go through them. And obviously there's more, probably will be more questions than we will have time to go through, but I'll, I'll uh, select some questions and they'll each get uh, equal opportunities on that. I'll give you more um, details on that format uh, later. There's also a prize, I understand, uh, going to be some kind of a drawing, so I don't know what, uh, am I excluded from entering that as a conflict of interest? Uh, I, don't, I don't know what the prize is there. but. Um, okay, so then um, after the break, then there will be a Q&A of 30 minutes and alternating questions back and forth. I will explain that um, closer to the time. And then, then there will be closing remarks. So after the Q&A, um, then uh, Greg Stafford will go first and uh, Rob Bowman will go second. They will have in their um, closing remarks opportunities to um, kind of uh, give a state of the debate, you know, in other words, what, what questions, uh, do, do they believe that the, the issue was adequately addressed? What issues may still be outstanding that need to be resolved to get closure on this particular debate? So that's the, that's the layout, that's the form, that's the structure we're going to follow. Hopefully it will go smoothly. I'm, I'm confident that it will. In that regard, um, just a, a comment uh, in terms of um, the participation of you as the audience is to be uh, uh, very uh, careful uh, to hold your applause until the end of the end of the debate, uh, regardless of which person you favor or which arguments you favor. We want to hold those until the end of the debate so as not to be distracting either to the debaters or to uh, those who are trying to concentrate on the um, argumentation that's being done. Certainly, we, um, I realize that um, this could be a, a debate where uh, some people may have very strong feelings on one side or the other, but I would ask that you um, be careful, be uh, solicitous about um, disruptive behaviors and uh, um, no cheering, booing, things like that, as the case may be. And uh, we'll trust that that will be so, so that I don't have to pop up and. Uh, give some admonitions in that uh, regard. And of course, I already know the debaters are going to follow the time limits, and hopefully I won't botch that timer and totally mess things up, but they will be uh, signaled as to how much time they have. So we're going to try and run a tight ship here and at the same time have a, a good time. So um, I guess, unless I am mistaken, we, we, we go ahead and begin. And so we will go ahead and uh, Give this now to Rob Bowman, who will have 20 minutes. Um, that's right, you can. Uh, well, good evening. Uh, thank you for coming, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity finally to meet Greg after a number of years of, of interaction online. Uh, a, a virtual relationship is not nearly as good as a real one, so it's a pleasure finally to meet Greg in person. And uh, also many of you that I have not met, and I've already had a chance to meet some of you, so uh, thank you for coming. Uh, it's, uh, I feel a little funny about this because the last time I did a public debate, all the Jehovah's Witnesses in the audience were on my side. Uh, that's because we were debating the existence of God. Uh, the other person was an atheist. Uh, <laughs> uh, so. Um, no, we thought, you mean you were a Jehovah's Witness then? <laughs> no, uh, but we, we uh, made some good friends then. And, um, 
And I'm, I'm happy that some of them are here, uh, and uh, we've already had some nice interaction beforehand. So I, I uh, just want to make that uh, observation that uh, uh, I don't really feel uh, or think about this as a, a, in an adversarial way, but I think that, uh, as Alan said, uh, Dr. Gomes said, we want to make this an informative time uh, for all concerned. I also would like to commend uh, Greg uh, in the very careful and thoughtful way that he handles uh, issues uh, of, of theological concern and the fact that he has, uh, I think, proved uh, in his uh, most recent book that I've seen that uh, he's not simply uncritically accepting the opinions uh, of others, but he is thinking through these things for himself. And, uh, of course, I hope that he'll continue to do that, um, as I'm sure uh, I need to do that as well. So uh, we're here uh, not to uh, debate each other's religions uh, and the, the, the foibles of them, good or bad, in the past, and we can both uh, find things to talk about in, in that context in another setting. But we're here specifically to debate the question, is Jesus God? Now, um, let me stipulate, by the way, before I go any further, that uh, uh, neither Greg nor I will uh, have a chance to present one one-hundredth of what we know on this subject <laughs> in the time that we have, and there's a lot more that could be said, and I hope that you'll see this uh, next two hours as the beginning of a discussion, not uh, the conclusion of it. But uh, when we talk about uh, the, the person of Jesus Christ, the identity of Jesus Christ, uh, let, let me specify very clearly what it is that I am going to be defending in defending the proposition that Jesus is God, really there are three points that need to be uh, kept together uh, or there will be a distortion of the position that I am taking. Uh, number one, Jesus is identical with God. That is, he is the Lord, also known as uh, Jehovah or Yahweh. So that's proposition number one, that Jesus is uh, identical with God. He is God. He is the Lord. Uh, number two, uh, though, Jesus is personally distinct from someone very often referred to simply as God, and specifically, he's distinct from God the Father. Jesus is not God the Father. Now, <clears throat> of course, the first point that I made, uh, the first proposition, is the central issue uh, that is dividing us uh, and the two positions represented in this debate. The second proposition, that Jesus is personally distinct from God the Father, uh, Greg and I agree on this, although we disagree on the ramifications of it. Uh, Greg will uh, no doubt think that this second proposition is incompatible with the first. That is, Jesus cannot be God and distinct from God. Uh, whereas uh, I maintain that it is uh, paradoxical in relation to the first proposition, but not contrary to the first proposition. Uh, and I simply leave it at that for the purpose of this debate. That's as far as I wish to go on that that I'm, I'm going to be defending the proposition that Jesus is God, I acknowledge and maintain as part of my own uh, theology, of course, that Jesus is also personally distinguishable in some way from God, specifically from God the Father. Third, and this is also crucial, although it's not uh, the, the direct topic, it is a crucial element of the view that I am maintaining, of course, uh, Jesus is not simply and uh, an abstract, in the abstract God uh, but in, uh, in my view, Jesus was and is also, from his historical conception on, a human being. Uh, so when Jesus was on the earth, he wasn't just God, he was God and he was a man. And uh, I also maintain that Jesus is still a man, he's still a human being in the resurrection. Now, uh, we also part company on the, that issue. One might think it's not directly germane to the debate, but it is uh, important because certain issues that, that appear to, uh, or certain matters of scriptural teaching that appear to contradict the idea that Jesus is God, that is, that appear to contradict the first proposition on the table here, uh, in my understanding, are reconciled or, exact, in fact, expected if Jesus was both God and human. And I, again, recognize this is um, uh, difficult to uh, wrap our heads around, but that is the position that I am uh, maintaining. Uh, of course, I'm going to focus on that first proposition for the sake of time. Now, how do we test the thesis that I'm going to be presenting here? Uh, I, I, do not, I do need to show, and this is my intent, to show that it is the best explanation of the biblical evidence. I do not plan to, sh to argue that anybody with half a brain would read the biblical evidence the way I do. I realize that's not the case. 
I'm not going to maintain that it's absolutely impossible to come up with some explanation other than the one that I'm defending. But I do maintain that it is the best explanation of the biblical evidence. Uh, secondly, I'm not attempting here to prove the entire systematic doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, the doctrine of the uh, identity of Jesus as God is a preliminary and essential step toward a doctrine of the Trinity, but it is not the doctrine of the Trinity. And uh, I am not going to attempt to defend the doctrine of the Trinity in this debate. If that's a subject of interest to you, beyond the uh, premise that we're going to be focusing on tonight, namely that Jesus is God, we have a material, uh, an outline study that I've done on the doctrine of the Trinity that you can uh, look at for free at our website, apologetics.com. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, for sake of time, I will not be able to uh, look at the entire doctrine, and that's really not the focus of this uh, debate. Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to attempt to prove uh, every element of the doctrine of the Trinity. And in fact, I'm not even going to presuppose the doctrine of the Trinity uh, in any way. I'm simply going to be, uh, I believe in the doctrine of the Trinity, but that's not what I'm going to be uh, advancing here. I'm simply going to be advancing the uh, claim of that first proposition that Jesus is God. Now, how do we test this biblically? Well, we have to look at all what the Bible says, and obviously we can only scratch the surface in the time that we have. So I'm going to try to focus on some major passages, uh, passages that I think Greg and I both agree are of major import or concern in this discussion, uh, though he'll be free to correct me if he disagrees with that assessment as well. Before I look at some of these biblical passages, then let me state very quickly things that cannot count against the thesis that I'm advancing. These are crucial points because any points that are made along these lines simply, in my view, do not count against my view that Jesus is God. Uh, the first kind of thing that uh, will not count are any statements that distinguish Jesus from God the Father or even Jesus from someone simply called God. That's part of my theology. That's part of the position that I'm defending. So any statements along those lines simply will not count against the proposition that I'm defending. Statements that indicate that Jesus uh, is subordinate or even to inferior to God in his human existence, uh, you know, from his human conception on, uh, in, have any kind of relationship whatsoever to his uh, having become a human being uh, will not count against my position because, of course, I believe Jesus is both God and man. And third, statements that indicate that Jesus, as a human being, is in some way part of creation. Those also don't count against my view, because I believe that in the Incarnation, Jesus Christ became part of his creation, that God became part of the human race. He joined himself to the human race. The Creator joined himself to the creation. So any statement that uh, assumes that Jesus is in some way part of creation within that context is uh, part and parcel of my understanding and will not count against it. Now, making these points, I'm not trying to argue that there's no possible way that Greg can find anything that might contradict my position. He's welcome to have a shot at it, but I, I do think that it's fair to point out that certain kinds of statements in the Bible, in and of themselves, simply would not contradict the view that I'm defending. Now, uh, there's, again, many things I'd like to look at here with you in the short time that we have, so I'm going to, just going to have to focus on a few uh, select passages and you have, some of you have this handout that uh, was at the registration table, and I'll refer to this as much as I can in the short time we have. Uh, first of all, we have a number of passages in Scripture that actually speak of Jesus as God. That is, they call him God. Now, this would not be uh, of any uh, significance whatsoever for our debate if the term God could be used willy-nilly of just about anybody. But in biblical theology, there is only one real God. And there are all other uh, so-called gods are not really divine beings at all. Uh, you know, we find statements throughout the, the scriptures asking questions like, who is a god besides the Lord? You know, this, this kinds of question is common. You know, flat out statements in Isaiah, in Deuteronomy, uh, in, in 1 Timothy, and many other passages that there is one God, one and only one uh, true God. So that is basic, and uh, so when we look at these statements that identify Jesus as God, uh, we have to consider the possibility that they mean what they seem to mean, namely that Jesus is God. Now, there's a way to check that beyond simply the, uh, the, the, pre the premise that uh, if they affirmatively acknowledge Jesus to be God, that must be what they mean, and that is to look at the context of these statements 
Are they talking about Jesus in a way that in some way identifies him with, equates him with uh, the creator of the universe, uh, or is there, is there a clear a differentiation that, that denies him that status, uh, that, that puts him in, the, in a lower category? So we look, for example, at John chapter 1, verse 1. It isn't merely that Jesus is called God, although that in and of itself is very significant, but that he's called God in the context of a stating that he was there at the very beginning of creation, that all things that were created came into existence through him, nothing has been created apart from him, that in him itself is life and light. These are the kinds of statements that uh, anyone familiar with the Old Testament scriptures would understand was putting Jesus in the same category as God in a functional sense as well as actually calling him God. And so that, that strengthens and confirms the impression that one has from John chapter 1 that Jesus is God. Uh, one thing that many of you may be familiar with in the annals of the debate over this subject that go, well, you know, have been going on for some time is the fuss and feathers over the uh, fact that there is no article, the word the, before God in the Greek text of John 1, 1, part C. Uh, the word was God, or the logos was God. Uh, one of the things that you'll see on this handout that uh, has been made available to you is that what's really surprising in John 1 is that the article is ever used in front of the name God. Uh, and you have a table there that shows the various occurrences of theos, or the Greek word for God, in John 1, 1 to 18, which is known as the prologue to the gospel. It's only used one time in front of theos, possibly twice. There's a textual question in verse 18. Uh, and all the other occurrences, it's without the article. And if you look at that table, I think you can see that uh, there's probably no significance to the omission of the article whatsoever. Uh, in John 20, verse 28, uh, the climactic affirmations of Jesus at the end of John chapter 20 uh, is that he is my Lord and my God, according to Thomas, and uh, that he is the Son of God in whom, by believing in him, we have life through uh, believing in his name. Now, these are not incompatible affirmations in my theology. Remember, Jesus is God, and he's also distinguishable from God in some way. He is God and the Son of God at the same time. But John chapter 20, verse 28, a very strong text uh, in which Thomas acknowledged Jesus as his Lord and his God. And Hebrews chapter 1, we have a sustained argument on the part of the writer of Hebrews that Jesus is superior, greater than, better than the angels. And the statements that are made about Jesus in that context in, in Hebrews chapter 1 are startling if one does not believe that Jesus is God and something will have to be done with them. Uh, we are told, again, very similar to John chapter 1, that uh, the worlds, the ages, were created through him, were made through Jesus. Later on, that is uh, backed up with a proof text from Hebrews chapter 1. In Hebrews chapter 1, verses 10 to 12, uh, the writer backs up his statement that, that the Son uh, was involved in creation with a citation from Psalm 102, verses 25 to 27, in which the psalmist is acknowledging the Lord God as the one who made heavens and earth, the heavens and the earth. Now this text, which in the context of Psalm 102, clearly is referring to Jehovah God as the one who laid the foundations of the earth, that the heavens are the works of his hands, is quoted verbatim and applied to Jesus, the Son. And he is affirmed there to be the one uh, who laid the foundation. Jesus, the Son, is the one who laid the foundations of the earth, and the works, the heavens are the works of the Son's hands, according to uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 10 to 12. In Hebrews 1, verse 8, we have a quotation from Psalm 45, in which the king of Israel was called God. And this verse is applied to Jesus. Many people are confused about this, and I'm not speaking about Greg being confused, but many people look at this and say, well, how could the king of Israel be God? And the answer is, he wasn't. But he was a foreshadowing, a type of one who was to come, who would be the king of Israel, and would also, in fact, be God, namely Jesus. And that is, I think, the argument that the writer of Hebrews is making there, that Jesus Christ is himself God. And of course, in, again, back in Psalm 102, uh, quoted in verses 10 to 12, uh, we have an affirmation that the person that we're speaking about here is eternal. He is everlasting. So there are a number of statements made in Hebrews chapter 1 
that show that Jesus is God in a variety of ways. And again, I apologize for the uh, cursory overview that you're getting here, but uh, hopefully this will at least give you an, a sense of what we're looking at. Now then there are a couple of statements made in the epistles that I think are rather clear about the identity of Jesus Christ. In Titus 2.13, the apostle Paul says that we are awaiting the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I've given you the, uh, the Greek uh, wording there, transliterated, for those of you who are not familiar with this. Uh, there is a structure here in which you have, which is uh, governed by something called Sharp's Rule. I say governed by, I mean Sharp's Rule really describes the way this particular uh, syntax or word order structure tends to work in biblical Greek and uh, perhaps outside of biblical Greek as well to some extent. And I've given numerous examples there at the bottom of the page there on page two of your handout where we see this uh, pattern working. For example, everywhere in Paul's epistles and in the other epistles at the Salutations, when you see someone called the God and Father or the God and our Father, uh, that's not two persons, that's one person. Uh, God the Father, it's just another way of speaking of God the Father. By the way, Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, didn't know about Sharp's rule and he made a serious mistake. He understood Revelation 1.6, which speaks of God and his Father in the King James Version, to mean God and God's Father. It was apparently Grandpa God, okay? <laughs> Uh, now, um, uh, Sharp's rule accurately describes what was wrong with uh, Smith's interpretation of that particular verse, and it applies equally, in my view, to Titus 2.13, as well as to 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. 2 Peter 1.1 1, 1 calls Jesus Christ our God and Savior, calls him our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Then in four uh, succeeding verses later on throughout the epistle, we find uh, Peter referring to Jesus as our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, or some variant on that phraseology. Nobody misreads, I don't think anybody misreads, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to mean our Lord, that's person number one, Savior Jesus Christ, that's person number two. Uh, and similarly, our God and Savior Jesus Christ uh, is most naturally understood in Peter's uh, way of speaking then as referring to one person, Jesus Christ, as both God and Savior. Now on the third page, we have a number of passages in which Jesus Christ is freely called the Lord, uh, kurios in Greek, in a way that seems to equate Jesus with the Lord God of the Old Testament. In fact, it so clearly does this that in the New World translation of the Jehovah's Witnesses, the same Greek word is translated Lord in some contexts and Jehovah in other contexts. Now I don't wish to turn this into a debate about the divine name. I'm simply pointing out that if you accept the Greek text as it stands and don't subscribe to uh, a theory that says that the early church uh, conspired to take that name out and you simply go with the text as you have it, there does appear to be an equation of, the, of uh, Jesus with the Lord God of the Old Testament. Uh, you can look through that list and you can see what I mean. Finally, I wish to point out that in the New Testament we have abundant evidence that Jesus receives the same honors that are due God. We are told that we are to honor the Son just as we honor the Father in John 5, 23. Uh, Christians are actually defined in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2 as those who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. To call upon the name of a heavenly figure in ancient language simply meant to pray to him, to appeal to him as your divine uh, savior, as your divine help. Uh, we are told to worship Jesus. We are told to serve Jesus in Daniel 7, 14, at least in most of the Greek manuscripts uh, of the Septuagint or the Greek Old Testament. We are told to fear Christ, for example, in Ephesians 5.21. We are encouraged to make our petitions to him and to believe in him the same way we believe in God, John 14, verse 1. And then we are encouraged to give glory to Jesus in doxologies, very much in the style that are given to God. Thank you very much. Good evening to all of you. I'm glad to be here this evening, and I'm appreciative of the opportunity to speak to you about this subject. As Rob mentioned, there are a lot of things we're not going to be able to talk about this evening, but some of the things we are going to be able to cover are essential to Christian theology. In fact, everything we discuss in relation to the question of whether Jesus is God is something that all of us need to take in serious thought and prayer. And the reason I say that is because it's often easy for anybody of any religion or faith to presume a certain theology, to presume that 
what we've been taught to believe to this point in our lives is correct. We may be able to finesse it, fine tune it, learn a little bit more, but essentially, it's comfortable to have a certain set of beliefs. It's uncomfortable to have those beliefs challenged. It's even more uncomfortable and difficult when the people that challenge those beliefs are often put in a light that's not very positive. And so there's a tendency, it's a human tendency, I think, to react strongly against those things which threaten our security. And certainly our beliefs are some of the things that we hold most dear and secure. And so on this question of, is Jesus God examining the biblical evidence? How should we answer that question? How do I answer that question? Why is my opinion important? Well, we've heard what Rob Bowman has had to say, and he represented very well, in my opinion, what the traditional Trinitarian, classical Trinitarian position is. In fact, Rob's works go a lot further than many in, in describing and articulating uh, defenses for the Trinity, which I appreciate and discuss in some of my writings as well. However, what we're trying to figure out here in answering this question is what do we mean? Oftentimes we can say things, but what do we mean? If, if what we say doesn't match up with what we mean, then it really doesn't matter what we say. It only really matters what we mean. So what does Trinitarianism tell us about is Jesus God? Or what did Rob more specifically tell us about that? I'm not going to critique what he said at this point. That will come later. But I think it is important to essentially you know, briefly summarize what he said so that I can distinguish my negative answer from his affirmative. Essentially, what I gathered from Rob's discussion was that he believes that Jesus is God. He's fully divine, equal with the Father. To use a technical term, consubstantial, meaning sharing the same essence of being, so that they are neither greater nor less than the other in any sense by nature. Yet they are personally distinct. And that's a difficult concept. Why? Because when we think of distinctions between persons, we can look next to us and see a different person. But we also see a different being. We see a division in substance, in nature. There's two people, or in the case of the crowd tonight, many. When it comes to God, what we see in Trinitarianism is a distinction in persons, but not in being. You can't look next to you, if you're one of these persons in God, and see another being, yet you can recognize, in the spiritual realm, a distinct person. I reject that concept. I don't think it's scriptural to say that Jesus is God in terms of being a person of God. And that's essentially what I say Trinitarians, Trinitarians are telling us. It's not true that I disagree that Jesus is God in every sense. It is true that I disagree and reject the notion that Jesus is God, a person of the Trinity. I also reject the notion that some, that some may be confused into believing, but that is not, of course, Rob's position, nor that of classical Trinitarianism. That when you say Jesus is God, you mean Jesus is the Trinity. But why might people come to that conclusion? Because in Trinitarianism, and of course as Rob alluded to in scripture, you often find phrases and descriptions that say, there is only one God. There are no other gods but me, says Jehovah. And so naturally, you only accept the existence of one true almighty God. And if you're going to consider that true almighty God a trinity, a triunity of persons, then to turn around and say, Jesus is God, can lead to the conclusion that Jesus is the Trinity. That's not Rob's position. That's not Trinitarianism. But you can see how that can happen. And that, there's a real problem there. Because if there is only one God, and if that one God is the Trinity, I say you cannot say Jesus is God without qualifying or explaining what you mean. And too often that's the problem. We are Jehovah's Witnesses, and myself included, and other groups who reject the Trinity are often described as rejecting Christ's deity. We don't believe Jesus is God. And that's not essentially true. It is true in the senses that I've mentioned, in that I and Jehovah's Witnesses reject that Jesus is a person of God. But that's not what the question is. Is Jesus God? I contend that if Rob is going to take the affirmative on that question, which he has, that he has to explain further what he means. And he did to some extent. But I contend that in every instance that he or someone else says that phrase, you must explain yourself. More importantly, every time you go to the scriptures and you try to defend the affirmative statement, is Jesus is God, you don't just have to show that the Bible calls Jesus God. You have to show that it means what you mean when you say Jesus is God. So the question is, who can do that? Who can turn to the scriptures and show that when they say Jesus is God, that it means what they say? 
Can we look at the scriptures and find their articulation that shows or suggests or even implies that that means that Jesus is a person of a triunity? Can we, on the other hand, turn to the scriptures and find statements that show that Jesus is God in a different way, a representative or authoritative way? Further, can we show that Jesus is ontologically distinct from God? By that, I mean different in nature, just like you're looking at a person next to you. Two different beings, not just two different persons. There's a lot of technical words and history behind the development of the Trinitarian doctrine. We will not be able to explore and discuss all of the meanings that are packed into some of the words used, but while I'll do the best I can, I'm sure Rob will as well. When I say Jesus is God, I mean it in two ways. And when I say is God, I mean capital G, O-D. Authoritatively, Jesus has been given all authority in heaven and on earth, according to Matthew 28, 18. All authority. The kind of authority that only God could have. Yet it's been conferred upon Jesus. It's not something he's had all along. Otherwise, it wouldn't need to be conferred to him. Or if it was conferred to his human self or person, it wouldn't need to be conferred to his human self by the Father. His divine self could have done it. Representatively, I would also say Jesus is God. And by representatively, I mean if you look at Jesus in the heavenly realm and you look at God, which you could only do if you're in the heavenly realm, you wouldn't see a difference. And I say that because in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, the author of Hebrews makes it very clear that Jesus is the outshining of God's glory, the copy of his essence or being. That tells us a lot. That tells us that, it's, that Jesus is, in fact, an exact copy of God. But to be a copy of God, not just of a person of God, that naturally implies, on the simplest meaning, without reading into it any kind of technical or involved complex ideas, a division. If you're a copy of something else, you're not that something else. You're not a part of it. You're separate. This is the plain language of Scripture used to describe the relationship in terms of nature or essence, these very important theologically loaded terms in relation to God and Jesus. And so I would agree and affirm that Jesus is God, both in terms of his authority and representation. There's no question in my mind that Thomas looked at Jesus and, and affirmed that he said, my Lord and my God. I have no problem making the same declaration to Jesus if he stood before me now. But I would contend that Trinitarians cannot make that same declaration with the same meaning that Thomas had in mind. I find it difficult to believe that Thomas had a complex understanding, or an involved, we'll say, of what it meant to be God in relation to a triune being, and that he actually appreciated and understood Jesus' role and position within a triune Godhead. I see no evidence of that in Scripture, no articulation, no discussion, not only in Scripture but in literature of the same period. We find that later. But the point is, we could say that Thomas may have had some inkling or some idea. Maybe he didn't have a fully developed understanding of the relationship between Jesus and God and how it all worked out. But the point is, it's not there. You can say that, you can argue that, but you cannot find this kind of articulation that is necessary and essential to Trinitarianism in those statements. So when I read John 20, 28, or when I read Titus 2, 13, scriptures that I do have differences of opinion on with respect to whether or not they actually say what Trinitarians uh, want them to say in far, as far as translation. But setting that aside, I can accept every single verse that Rob would point to and say that calls Jesus God. I can accept every single one of them. Because the meaning of the text in the context of that period of time does not come with the theological implications that I suggest he ascribes to them and that Trinitarians ascribe to them today and in centuries following the closing of the New Testament era. There are senses in which others in the scriptures are called God, both representatively, authoritatively, and I would argue ontologically. That is, again, by nature. You can look in the Hebrew scriptures where in the books of Genesis and Judges, angels are often called God, spoken to by Abraham and others as God, or even Jehovah, directly addressed. But that doesn't create a problem. Not for me. And some, for some Trinitarians, it wouldn't either. They would say that that's a theophany and perhaps even Jesus himself in his pre-incarnate state. But yet it says angels. That fact must not be overlooked. We can also point to the fact that angels spoke with authority for God, acted in his behalf, but always because they were sent by God as his messengers or servants. Do we find anything different with Jesus? Isn't it true that in the scriptures he's often referred to as God's servant, the one sent forth to do not his will, 
but the will of his Father. There are striking similarities between the role of Jesus and angels in the Old Testament, and yet there are striking differences. He clearly is different. He's not a mere angel. Angel, by the way, simply means messenger. And if Jesus, Jesus was not a messenger, no one was. But Jesus was also a king, the anointed, the Messiah. So he's special and different. And as a human, he was not an angel. My position is not that he was an angel, nor is it that of Jehovah's Witnesses. So it's no, no wonder that in Hebrews, he is described as better than angels, having been anointed as a royal king and Messiah. I would also say Jesus is, again, not God in terms of a person of God for several reasons, which we've already mentioned, but which I'll summarize. The Bible does not articulate this kind of personal distinction within the Godhead. You will not find that language there. But what you will find is the often used texts, some of which Rob mentioned, that apply the term God, Theos or El in Hebrew, to Jesus. And the understanding just sort of comes with it. If you can prove Jesus is called God, well, that must mean he's part of the Trinity. It seems to go that way far too often. The Bible does articulate a distinction between Jesus and God in terms that absent the Trinitarian articulation we heard from Rob and which I described would normally convey a distinction in nature. We referred to John 1 earlier, and so did Rob. What does that text actually tell us? Or what does it say? Let's leave aside the controversial part. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was Theos. The Word, it does not say the Word was with the person of the Father, and the Word was another person of God. It doesn't say that. It says the Word was with God, and the Word was either God or a God, but I can't find a way, and I've not seen any acceptable articulation of how you can get God to mean person of God, or how you can get Word was with God to mean Word was with the person of the Father. But that is essential to have. You can't have Jesus being God and being with God, as Rob said earlier, and I don't suggest that. In fact, I say specifically that that's the problem. The Bible also articulates that Jesus is theos in terms of an individual, unique God. Several texts already referred to by Rob would show this. Some I would disagree with, and which we'll discuss in the criticism part. But nonetheless, if they were all applied to Jesus or applied the term theos to Jesus, what would that tell us? That Jesus is theos. It does not tell us that he's a person of theos. There are several other texts that makes this, make this point clear. We've mentioned John 1.1 1, 1 already. John 1.18 calls Jesus the monogenes theos, meaning in some translations only begotten God. The term monogenes, only begotten, is disputed. It's not clear whether it means only begotten, unique, or only. But in any case, what is it doing? It's describing the term theos as an adjective. Jesus is the something God. He's this kind of God as opposed to that kind of God. Not this kind of person of God, this kind of God. I contend that that shows an ontological distinction, a division in terms of theos. It's fascinating when you read the account in John 10, 34 through 36, where the Jews are contending that Jesus made himself theos. Again, many translations will say, why, Jesus says, why are you stoning me? Well, not for a fine work, but because you claim to be God capital G-O-D. The New World Translation and a few others say a God. But what was Jesus' response to that question or that challenge? He quoted Psalm 82, is it not written that you are gods? Whether he's referring directly to the Israelite judges or the angels, as I contend, what's the point here is that Jesus responded to this allegation of their claim that he claimed to be Theos by referring not to a text that refers to God Almighty, but that refers to other gods, what we'll call secondary or non-almighty gods, either angels or Israelite judges. But that was the text Jesus used to defend whatever charge they were make, claiming he made, which I would contend is that he was a god. They were claiming, they were challenging Jesus' position and disputing the fact that he was in fact a god, whether angelic or um, Israelite magistrate type. So the point is that Jesus himself tells us on what level the charge was being made. And he responded by saying, look, if you can be called gods, what's the problem? You know, I'm not making, you know, this is claim is not something that's, that's unusual or unheard of. But they simply weren't going to accept it on any level. They believed him to be a demonic heretic. 
So to summarize the points that I've made to this, at this, in this opening statement, Jesus is not God, if by this we mean to identify him as a fully divine person of the Trinity. He's not ontologically, where, where, which would mean he's not ontologically distinct from the Father. I reject that notion. I believe that he is distinct from the Father. They are two different gods, which we'll discuss in a little bit more detail later, and that that is a, an entirely scriptural notion. There's nothing in the scriptures that says that you absolutely cannot be God on any level unless you're almighty God. There are texts that deny the existence of other gods, but this is how scripture often speaks. You're familiar with the scripture in Isaiah 44 where it says, or 43.10, besides me there is no savior. And some may say, well, see, Jesus is also the savior. He must be God. But yet Ehud and Benjamin in the book of Judges are called savior, the Hebrew word Moshiach. So what does this tell us? That different words are often used with different senses. And while we might take the negative and say there is no other this but me, there are still others who can bear that title or description in a different sense. In John 8, 39, the account in John 8, 39, the Jews are disputing with Jesus again. And Jesus says, if Abraham were, fa were your father, uh, you would you not treat me this way, essentially. And the Jews said, um, no, I'm sorry, Jesus says, if God were your father, you would not treat me this way. And the Jews... Uh, uh, he says someone's not his father, it's either Satan or God, but the point is that they responded and said, we have one father, God. But a couple verses later, they specifically referred to Abraham as their father. So what does this tell us? Abraham is God? Not likely. The point they were making was that in one sense, God is their father and no one else is their father in that sense. But certainly Abraham is their patriarchal father and can appropriately be referred to by that same description. So it's not true that by the simple reference of negative uh, statements in the scriptures to the fact that besides me there are no other gods, most of which are in Isaiah or Deuteronomy, and all of which I contend and describe in my books, or discuss in my books, refer to the non-existence of idol gods of the nations, not the angelic gods who serve God, and certainly not God's only begotten son. We have to look at these in context and not make hasty decisions about what they mean and say, well, no means no, no matter what, because then we're going to run into a whole host of exegetical interpretive and um, scriptural problems. So Jesus is an individual, unique God, distinct in his essence from God. He is not God in terms of being a person of God, nor is he God if by that we mean to identify him with the Trinity, one sense in which Rob and I would agree. We can call Jesus God in a representative and authoritative capacity senses which are both attributed to angels in various, sense, various ways and in various texts, but that in no sense are ever attributed to beings other than Jesus to the extent that the Bible describes himself. And so in this way, I do take the negative that Jesus is God with respect to the meanings that are poured into that phrase by Trinitarians, but I most certainly do affirm that Jesus is God in the senses in which the Bible articulates it. Okay, hey, thank you, and I appreciate very much your uh, kind uh, attentiveness in the, as these were presented. Um, now we're going to move to a very interesting section of this debate, and this is going to be the uh, rebuttal phase. Um, and during this time, uh, Rob Bowman is going to come up and have 15 minutes to um, offer challenges and criticisms of the view uh, defended by Greg. And then uh, after his 15 minutes is up, Greg will return the favor and uh, offer some criticisms of the position that Rob uh, presented. So let's move forward. Let me set the clock first. I don't know about you. I wish we were taking that 15-minute break now. <laughs> well, I really appreciate uh, Greg's uh, presentation and uh, the clarity with which he presented his uh, um, criticism of the view that Jesus is God. Uh, one of the problems with the way that this uh, uh, debate uh, question has been framed is that uh, it really leaves uh, the, the, the entire uh, position uh, to be proved or disproved on my side. And uh, we will apparently probably not hear too much, although maybe he would like to uh, 
at some point from Greg as to what he believes about Jesus in a positive sense, other than he's not God, although he has said certain things uh, indirectly about what he thinks about Jesus, having all authority and so forth. But uh, I think it's, you know, unfortunately, uh, we won't be able to delve uh, equally into both uh, of the positions that are represented here in that kind of way. Now, um, I, I warned you <laughs> ahead of time that I was not uh, here to uh, debate the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, with all due respect, I think Greg is. Uh, and I don't blame him for that. That's, that's uh, his approach to this question, and, uh, and, and, I, and I, I realize that. Uh, his concern is, if I'm going to say Jesus is God, then, uh, you know, uh, as uh, Ricky used to tell Lucy, you've got some splaining to do, uh, because I don't understand how you can say Jesus is God, and yet there's someone else called God, and yet you're saying there's only one God. I don't get it. I, I understand that's the problem here. Uh, but I would simply submit that uh, in seeing the problem, you are at least halfway home because now you recognize why the Church Fathers developed the doctrine of the Trinity as a systematic formulation to bring all these statements together. And at the end of the day, they were not going home saying, well, we got that all figured out. But rather, they were going home saying, well, at least we know what's not true. And we have some idea of what is true, but we don't claim that we really fully understand it. Uh, so I, I'm, not, you know, with, I'm not at all embarrassed to say I don't completely understand this myself. Uh, but uh, the, the position that I'm taking is that Jesus is God, uh, and that when the Bible says Jesus is God, it means he is God, not that he is merely a person of God in, in, this, in a way that would somehow make that mean something different than saying Jesus is God. Uh, that uh, Jesus is the Lord God, the creator of the universe, Jehovah, Yahweh, El Shaddai, etc., etc., and uh, there are, uh, in all of those affirmations would be true uh, in my understanding of what Scripture says. In most of those, I can actually document specific statements showing that that is the case, uh, that Jesus actually is God, not merely uh, as I, and Greg, to his credit, didn't do this, but as some folks have tried to say uh, that what Trinitarians mean is that Jesus is only one-third of God. Um, that is not, that's not the position that I'm advocating. But in any case, uh, when I say that Jesus is God, I do mean it. I do not mean that he's merely a part of God, uh, a person of God, a member of a committee that when they get together constitutes a quorum to be God. No, Jesus is God. And the Father is God. And, the, and there is one God. And welcome to the wild and wonderful world of biblical theology. In my opinion, that is biblical theology. And then... The doctrine of the Trinity is a post-biblical human attempt to understand it as best we can. Uh, and I do not accord the doctrine of the Trinity the kind of primacy in terms of biblical theology uh, that I do to the, to the deity of Christ as Jesus being God. It is an inference from a number of biblical statements. I think it's a correct inference. But I'm not going to try to work all that out here. Now, uh, uh, Greg uh, acknowledges that Jesus is God in two senses. If I, let me see if I have understood these correctly. The first sense is a kind of representative sense. Uh, Jesus represents God. He has God's authority conferred on him and uh, acts on God's behalf so that people can look Jesus in the eye and they could call him God. And what they really mean is that Jesus represents God, that he's there on God's behalf, at God's behest. Now, uh, that in the abstract would be a possible understanding. We have to look at the texts and see if that is how uh, the biblical texts actually use the title God when they're when it's they're applying the, it to Jesus. I think the answer, frankly, is no. They are not. Uh, again, I would go back to, uh, and I, I think Greg has uh, oversimplified some to some extent uh, the the uh, position that I'm taking by saying that. Uh, if we find a verse that says Jesus is God, since there's only one God, ipso facto, now we prove he's the same God. That is a valid argument, I think, if we understand it properly. But I did say, and I think this is very important, we need to test that understanding by looking at these passages in their contexts. And when we do that in John chapter 1 and in Hebrews chapter 1, uh, for example, where Jesus is called God in both of those passages, we and uh, in Hebrews 1 also called Lord, quoting from the Old Testament, 
uh, we find that Jesus is attributed the same works uh, as God in the Old Testament, that he actually does the things that God does. So he doesn't simply represent God in order to send a, bring a message. He's not just God's messenger boy. He actually is God. He does what God does. He does what God can only do. Uh, he is the judge of all the earth. He is the savior of the whole world. He's not like those uh, judges in the book of Judges that are occasionally called saviors because they delivered Israel from the Philistines or something. He is the savior of the world. He is our great God and savior. And that kind of language can only be understood in a biblical context to be referring to God, period. Now, Greg uh, says that uh, Jesus can't be God in that uh, unqualified uh, absolute sense because although he has all authority, it had to be given to him. Matthew 28, 18, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And since this is a conferred authority, it cannot be the underived, unconferred authority that God himself has. And then just to cover all the bases, Greg suggests that uh, if you want to argue uh, that Jesus had to be given this authority because uh, in respect to his humanity, well, why couldn't he give it to himself? Have just his divine nature, give it to his human nature, and be done. Why did the Father have to give it to the Son? Now, the answer to that is a very simple answer. It's found explicitly in the Bible, for example, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 11, which tells us that Jesus humbled himself to become one of us, to become that servant that Greg talked about. He's correct. Jesus is called the servant of the Lord. He's the servant of God. But he is not originally God's servant, but God's son. He becomes the servant of the Lord in his mission to redeem humanity and reconcile us to the Father. And so in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 11, we see that Jesus humbles himself. Now, who is he humbling himself in relationship to? In relationship to the Father, not in relationship to us. But his example there is, although he was in the form of God, Paul says, uh, equal in nature and stature to God by rights, he voluntarily took the position of a humble servant of the Lord to become one of us, to become a human being in order to die for our sins. And then Paul says in Philippians 2, 9, God highly exalted him, of course, meaning God the Father. Why did God have to highly exalt Jesus? Why couldn't Jesus highly exalt himself? Because he had, that was the deal, if you will. He voluntarily put himself in a place where his exaltation would come, not at his own hand, at his own decree, but at the decree of the Father. And Jesus himself laid down the pattern for his own teaching. Whoever wants to be exalted must first be humble. And if you exalt yourself, you're going to get humbled, so I suggest you do it the other way around. Now, the second meaning that Greg says he's willing to acknowledge Jesus being God is that Jesus is God and that he's a copy of God. This is like going to Kinko's, I guess. And I ran off some copies of this handout, but it's not the actual handout. See, I've got the actual handout. You've got just a facsimile. Well, uh, the problem here is twofold. Uh, first of all, I don't believe that it is accurate to say that in uh, the theology that Greg represents that Jesus actually is an accurate, complete copy of God the Father. For example, in, uh, and, and I, I'm not trying to change the subject into uh, Jehovah's Witness theology, but I believe that Greg in his theology holds that Jesus is a, a, a temporal creature who was brought into existence at a point in time Eternality is not part of his nature. He is now going to live forever uh, at God's uh, merciful grant, uh, uh, great gift, uh, but he is not in and of himself uh, of an eternal nature, just like we're not, according to his theology. Uh, Jesus is not by nature uh, God in terms of his essential attributes on a typical Jehovah's Witness theological view. And again, I'm quite uh, open and prepared to find that Greg is a little out of the mainstream there. We shall see. But I would maintain that that's the first problem, then, is that really in, in his theology, Jesus is not an exact copy of the Father because he doesn't have those uh, same ontological attributes, those same essential attributes of deity that are intrinsic to God 
uh, per se. The second problem with it is that, again, we're looking at passages in which uh, the writers are thinking of Jesus now that he has come into this world as a human being and has uh, joined uh, his eternal divine nature to ours. So when uh, the writer of Hebrews describes Jesus as the exact imprint or representation of the very nature and being of God, I think he's referring uh, ultimately to the incarnation. He's speaking of Jesus retrospectively as someone who has come into human, uh, the human race and joined himself to the human race. The same thing is true in Colossians 1.15 where Jesus is called the image of the invisible God. I understand that uh, incarnationally, if you will, to refer to Jesus in his humanity. A lot more could be said, obviously, about all these points, but I'll have to move on. Uh, it's a, a critical argument, uh, typically, in the, these kinds of this uh, debate uh, between Jehovah's Witnesses and uh, Orthodox Christians uh, regarding the identity of Jesus as God, to point out that various creatures, such as angels, uh, can be called gods in the Bible. Uh, Greg and I have spilled an awful lot of uh, ink, or at least uh, cyber ink, whatever that is, uh, discussing these points, so uh, we, uh, we could hardly even scratch the surface. Uh, su suffice it to say again that even if I were to grant that for the sake of argument, uh, which I don't actually, uh, the fact is that there are contextual indications in passages like John 1 and Hebrews 1 that show that Jesus is not simply being called a god in the same way that angels supposedly are called gods in Psalm 82 or Psalm 8 or what have you. Now, uh, one of the, uh, uh, at one point, Greg referred to uh, the Father and the Son, Jesus, as two different gods. Uh, you know, I, I, forgive me if I want to put that in bold type and large all capital letters to emphasize the point that that seems, at least on a surface reading, and I would even say on a depth reading of the Bible, to be quite contradictory to biblical theology to say that we have uh, one God, the Father, who is a big God, the eternal God, and then we have not quite such a big God, uh, the Son, who is a copy of the big God, and uh, they are the two different gods that run the universe, seems quite contrary to biblical theology in a number of levels, and I would maintain the deeper you go and the more you dig, the more you'll find that to be the case. E easy example, how many gods created the universe? The biblical answer is one. Isaiah 44, verse 24. And in fact, Jesus is equated with the Lord God who created the heavens and the earth in Psalm 102, verses 25 to 27, quoted by the writer of Hebrews chapter 1, verses 10 to 12. Uh, Greg mentioned Isaiah 43, verse 10, uh, or at least a verse somewhere around Isaiah 43, verse 10. It's interesting to note that the language there of Isaiah 43, verse 10, is picked up by Jesus himself and used of himself in John 8, verses 24 and 28, where Jesus says uh, that it's important, it's essential for the Jews to understand and know and believe, he says, that I am, ego a me. And it's not just those two words in the abstract or out of context, but it's those words in the context of uh, really mimicking or par par parroting the words of Jehovah God, the Lord God in Isaiah 43, verse 10, that show that Jesus is thinking of himself and presenting himself in the same way. Uh, Greg also mentioned the idea that uh, the various monotheistic texts in the Old Testament are all referring to false gods in the sense of idols when they say there are no other gods. I think that is contradicted, for example, by Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 35 and 39, which tells us that there is no other god on the earth or in heaven above, which I think explicitly excludes the idea of other gods in heaven reigning alongside the Lord God of the universe. Thank you very much. Didn't catch the exact reference on that last one, but I know the context of that has to deal with the Egyptian deities, so I'll have to take a closer look at that as I missed the reference. Or maybe I can get to it later in this evening. Uh, let me talk about a few things first off. This idea of being humbled while on earth and being a man and therefore all of these subordinationist or distinct, ontologically distinct statements can somehow be lumped together and, and put off on Jesus' humanity is, in my opinion, just plain bogus. The Bible does not say anything like that. 
All it says is that Jesus became a man. I shouldn't say all because that means a lot. He became a human being. He took on flesh. From what? From his pre-existent life. Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 9 doesn't just say Jesus humbled himself. It said he emptied himself. Of what? What did he give up? It says he was in the form of God or a God or in a divine form. Any one of those are fine with me. And he took on the form of a man. To me, that means he gave up the divine form and all that went with it. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians that although he was rich, he became poor. What was he rich in? How was he poor? Clearly, I believe Jesus was the last Adam, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. He was the equivalent to Adam, sinless, perfect, but not God. Neither was Adam God. And when Jesus was resurrected, the Bible says he became a life-giving spirit. It doesn't say that he retained this human nature that somehow limits him in one sense, but that he's almighty God in another sense. It doesn't say that. It can be implied in some sense, I suppose, but you have to do a lot of work to get that. This idea of the Father giving him authority and this notion that, well, because he humbled himself and relied on the Father, the Father had to give it to him. Well, who did the Father give it to? His humanity? Are we going to suggest that Jesus' humanity was given all authority in heaven and on earth? I don't believe that's the classical Trinitarian position. I don't believe that a man could have the kind of authority that only God could have, if that's how we're going to interpret that description. So who was given that authority? If it wasn't Jesus' humanity, it had to be his divinity. Of course, I reject the entire notion that Jesus has two natures within one person. I don't find it scripturally sound, nor is it scripturally defensible, in my opinion. It's something to develop much later. But you can find certain things. Trinitarians are not without any argument that suggests this kind of dual nature. I simply reject it and find evidence to the contrary. This idea of Greg debating the Trinity. It's true. We have to discuss the Trinity to some extent, or at least the language of Trinitarianism. When you say Jesus is God, immediately you've entered the discussion of what do you mean? In what sense is he God? And when you talk about God with a Trinitarian, and with a Trinitarian, you're talking about the Trinity. You cannot avoid it. But I try to limit it, yet it's necessary in order to properly understand what's happening. This idea of when Rob says, when I say Jesus is God, that's, I mean Jesus is God. Yes, but what do you mean by Jesus is God? We know you mean it, but what do you mean? Do you mean he's the Trinity? No, we know that. Do you mean he's a, an individual deity? No. What he means is similar to what Edmund J. Fortman meant when he wrote in his book, The Triune God. The Word and the Father are two distinct divine persons in one divine nature or Godhead. Or more simply, the Son is consubstantial with the Father. In the prologue, John 1, 1, when John calls the word God, he means this literally. Means what literally? That the Son is consubstantial with the Father. Right there, you're reading into the text significant theological language from another time, from another era. You will not find that in the text or any other text in the scriptures. But that's what Trinitarians mean. It's page 25, by the way. And I believe that's what Rob means. And if I talked to him long enough, I'm sure he'd admit that. And in his books, I can find statements that essentially say that same thing. Now, he might mean other things on other occasions, but essentially when he tells me Jesus is God, I know he doesn't mean the Trinity. I know he doesn't mean an individual deity. And I know he means a person of God and maybe a few more things along with it. Rob said several things in his opening statements that confirm this. He said, God the Father is simply another way of saying the person of the Father. So the description, God the Father, is essentially the same thing as person of the Father. What two terms were exchanged there? God and person. He also said that Jesus is personally distinct from the Father. But then just a second after he said that, he said, God, Greg will say, Jesus cannot be God and distinct from God. That's true. But Rob is going to say that Jesus can be God and distinct from the Father. What two terms were exchanged there? The Father and God. That's a significant point. And I would say that, that Rob didn't intend to do any kind of you know, deceitful action, but, but that just mentally, that that's how Trinitarianism expresses itself. It comes out in these ways, and these words are exchanged, and concepts are tied to certain words. And if you're not careful, 
You're going to hear these biblically sounding words. You're going to hear God. You're going to hear Father. You're going to hear Son. All biblical words. But behind those words mean person of or sharing the same essence with. Consubstantial, as Fortman said. Bowman's thesis, he said that there were several things that could not dispute what he had to say. One of them was statements that subordinate Jesus to God in relation to his humanity. Of course, I agree with that. It's obvious that Jesus as a human and subordinate to God is not going to contradict the position that he can also be equal with God on some level. But yet I would say that statements such as John 12, 14, 28, where he says the Father is greater than I, do not have the meaning that in his humanity the Father is greater than Jesus. What would that tell us? Are we, are, we, are we trying to suggest that the disciples didn't know that God was greater than a man? Clearly more is involved here. And Jesus didn't make any distinction. Well, as a human, but as a divine person, I'm equal. He made a very clear and blanket statement. The Father is greater than I. No qualification. And if it only meant in relation to his humanity, I would say he really didn't tell us a whole lot. He also said that statements that show that Jesus is distinguished from God could not contradict his position. I reject that completely. Statements that show Jesus is distinguished, distinct from God clearly contradict the notion that Jesus is God in the same sense as the one he's distinct from. But of course, Rob's going to take out the word God and put in the word Father and say, well, he's distinct from the Father personally, so there's no problem. There is a problem. That's not the distinction the Bible makes in terms of a person who's not also a distinct being, like the person next to you. Try distinguishing yourself from the person next to you without coming up with two individual humans. You can't do it. Now, Rob might say, well, then on the metaphysical level, you can do it. But the Bible doesn't articulate that, so we're not left with any basis for doing so. Rob mentioned several texts that support his position. As I mentioned, most of all of them, John 1, 1, 20, 28, Titus 2, 13, 2 Peter 1, 1, I disagree on some level with the translation of these, but I have no problem with any of those calling Jesus God. In fact, I would embrace them. They would support my position. That Jesus is himself God. He's not God as part of a triune God. He is an individual, unique deity. He just de his divinity is not dependent on his association or, or association in a triune God with other persons. Rob mentioned that Theos is used without the article many times, and that's not significant, therefore, when, he's, when, the Father, when God is called Ha Theos in John 1, 1 in distinction from Jesus. There's several other places in the prologue and elsewhere where Theos is used of God Almighty and yet not with the article. But that's not the point. The point is that in John 1, 1, where there's a distinction made, you have a distinction where one is called Theos with the article and the other is not. And Jehovah's Witnesses aren't the first ones to make this point. One of the greatest Bible scholars of the early church origin made this exact same point, that one is called Theos without the article and one is called Theos with the article, and they're distinct gods because of that reason. And we might be able to debate other portions of Origen's writings, but that's clear. And that does show a distinction. There's no doubt in anyone's mind, no one's going to dispute, I should say, the fact that there's a distinction in John 1.1. 1, 1. The dispute's going to come into play when we say, what is that distinction? Is it a personal distinction? Or is it an ontological, by nature, distinction? I say, let the text speak for itself. It describes the two in terms of theos. So let's make the distinction in terms of theos. Let's not change the terms and just use the same term and then explain it how we choose to or how we believe is correct. Let the Bible be consistent. If it says ha theos was with theos, let's carry over that same distinction, however it's going to be done. But make the distinction. And don't change the terms from theos to person or father or son. Not that Rob necessarily does that on every occasion, but I believe he would ultimately have to do so if pressed, as would any other Trinitarian. He further stated that uh, the Bible reveals there's only one true God, there's no other God. And earlier I mentioned a text that I didn't uh, get quite right. It's from John chapter 8, verse 39 through 41. I'm going to read it because it's so essential to this point. The Jews say, or the text says, In answer they, the Jews said to Jesus, Our father is Abraham. Jesus said to them, If you are Abraham's children, do the works of Abraham. But now you are seeking to kill me, a man that has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the works of your father. They said to him, we were not born from fornication. We have one father, God. But just a second ago, they said Abraham was their father. So again, it is not the case that when scripture uses limiting or negative language, there's no other, there's only one, that that must then mean there is no other sense in which that term can be applied to other beings in a positive sense. 
Now, Rob made the point that the context of certain verses, such as John 1 1 and Hebrews 1, shows that Jesus isn't considered God in the same way that angels, if, if he allows that they're called God in certain texts, are called gods, or that judges are called gods. The point we need to make is twofold. First, that the Bible does use the term God, theos, el, or in any of its uh, variations, of others in a positive sense. And again, I did not hear a rebuttal to the text in John 10, 34 through 36, not that he could remember or have to respond to everything, but I was curious to see if that particular text would get a response because Jesus there showed in what sense he was going to respond to the Jewish accusation that he was claiming to be God or, or a God. He did that not by appealing to some text that refers to God Almighty or appealing to some Old Testament text that is a foreshadowing of who he is. He could easily have quoted Isaiah 9, 6. Well, who's the mighty God? He could, have mis he could have stumbled them easily. He chose a text that used the term gods in reference to others in a positive sense, but that is not the same sense in which God Almighty is called God. And that is a significant point that must not be ignored. So yes, the context must be explored, as in John 1.1 and Hebrews 1. We've already talked enough about John 1.1, but this idea of being in the beginning and the creator, the Bible, when it refers to the in the beginning, as I show in my book, Jehovah's Witnesses Defended, is always referring to the beginning of the physical creation and, in fact, is doing so in Genesis 1.1. I'm not going to spend more time on that point because you can read my discussion of that in its published form. Similarly, when the Bible says Jesus was, all things were created through Jesus, that's what it means. God is the active agent. Jesus is the passive medium through which whatever activity is being done was done. That's not something that's just spoken of once or twice, but several times. In John, in Hebrews, in 1 Corinthians, in Proverbs, I would argue, and elsewhere. So Jesus did have a role in creation. But in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 17, you'll find it very interesting that passive verb forms for create are used in reference to Jesus, showing that he is not the initiator of the action, but that one is acting through him, bringing about a certain result. There's no question that Jesus is different from the angels, better and superior on a number of levels. As I mentioned, he is the only begotten or unique God. He is one who is king. He's not simply a mere angel, but he is a spirit being. God is a spirit being. We're all humans. We're just as human as each other. No one is more human in this room than each one of us. We're equal on that level. But we're not equal in terms of our attributes, our age, and a number of other ontological properties. So this idea that being fully God or fully divine must somehow carry with it the same temporal equality is not supported by scripture. To suggest that Jesus being a copy of God is similar to going to Kinko's and rain off a few copies is, is, in my opinion, absurd. And I, don't, I know Rob didn't mean anything by that, but I didn't say that. The Bible said that. Hebrews 1.3 said that Jesus was a copy of God's being. I didn't just come up with that language. It doesn't just say that he's a copy of the Father, and it doesn't say that he's just the image of God. That's in Col Colossians or Corinthians. I'm sorry, Colossians 1. We're images of God, as the Bible says in Genesis, but we're not copies of God's essence or being or the outshining of God's glory as in Hebrews 1. Clearly, Hebrews 1 is in the setting of Jesus' pre-temporal, pre-human life, the one through whom the worlds were made. So it's not correct to, say, to, to, again, lump all this up and toss it off onto Jesus' incarnate nature. That's not what Hebrews 1 does. Contextual indications in Hebrews, such as Hebrews 1.3, show us how we should understand verses 10 through 12. And again, in Hebrews 1.8, even if you allow him to be called God there, which is a, translated, a debatable translation, it says that is why God, your God, that is, Jesus is God. So if you're going to allow him to be called God there, you can't just switch around and say that his God is somehow a reference to his human nature, since we're obviously in this entire chapter, according to Rob, or, or most of it anyway, in these expressions, referring to his divine nature. It's a very selective interpretation, in my opinion, and simply doesn't hold up under close examination. As far as Psalm 102 and Hebrews 1, 10 through 12, I have a, an entire section on this in my book. Don't have enough time to go into it here and now, but I'd be happy to make copies for everyone if you'd like further discussion on that point. So uh, the way this will work is each um, debater will have up to two minutes if they wish to use the full two minutes to answer the question. If, if they need less time than that, that's fine. We'll go on to the next one. And, um, but they have up to two minutes. 
I actually have, uh, of the ones I called through and looked at for relevance, I have one, two, three, about seven questions for uh, Greg and six for Rob, but that, that should, we may not even get through all those. So let's uh, start with Greg. Um, the first question that we have here, uh, the questioner asks, if Jesus is not God, then why did he receive worship and praise from his disciples as only God should? For example, my Lord and my God, uh, in uh, the case of Thomas. Well, it's a two-part question in one sense. Let me answer it by saying that it's not the case that I reject that Jesus is God in every sense. As I mentioned earlier, there are senses in which I believe Jesus is appropriately considered God. However, when you're talking about the question of worship, we need specifics on the text that you referred to. However, I can assume several, um, all of which use likely the Greek word proskuneo, which has several different meanings. Um, and so in the sense that in which the Bible writers or the, the participants in the um, stories in the scriptures give Jesus worship or proskuneo, I would say it's entirely appropriate to his position as king of God's heavenly kingdom. In my book, Jehovah's Witnesses Defended, I have an entire section on that that deals with the issue of worship and how in the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament kings of Israel were frequently given proskuneo or worship. It's not, of course, the same worship that God himself has given in the religious sense, but it's appropriate nonetheless. And you can also read in Revelation chapter 3, verse 9, where Jesus says he would make others from the synagogue of Satan come and worship or proskuneo before the feet of the apostles or the uh, Christians of the first century. But you specifically reference John 20, 28 and the praise and worship that seems to be implied with the declaration Thomas made, my Lord and my God. Again, I don't see that that's incompatible at all with, with my view. My view is what the scriptures teach. And the scriptures do teach that Jesus is a divine being, that he is God in a certain sense. I reject the notion that he's a person of God and so that he's not God in that sense. But I am entirely comfortable with the position that says Jesus is God and that he can receive praise, and even worship in a relative sense due to the position and authority that's been conferred upon him. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, let's see if I can make this thing work. <laughs> All right. Um, this question is for uh, Rob Bowman. John 17, 3 has Jesus saying that the Father alone is, quote, the only true God. Therefore, on what basis do you call Christ God if, the on, if only the Father is, quote, the only true God? Well, first of all, uh, it is perfectly consistent with my uh, position to affirm that Jesus Christ is the only true God because in my uh, theology there is only one true God, not two, uh, not three, and not three million. Uh, so I don't have a problem with affirming that the Father is the only true God because there is no other God for him to be than the only true God. So that's the first point. Uh, secondly, uh, the fact is that this question cuts uh, both ways. In fact, I think it cuts sharper the other direction. If the Father is the only true God, what kind of God is Jesus? Is he a false God? Now. Uh, Greg Stafford and other Jehovah's Witnesses uh, faced with this uh, conundrum have suggested that the word true in John 17 verse 3 does not mean true, but actually means, uh, the Greek word aleithanos actually means uh, the archetype as opposed to the type. Uh, every other place in scripture where uh, Jehovah or God is called the only true God or called the true God, it is in the context clearly of him being contrasted with false gods. Uh, and there's a number of references uh, that you can find on our website that specifically uh, all the references where he is called the true God and you can see this for yourself. Thirdly, I maintain, and I know Greg will disagree with me on this because we've uh, just looked at this together, but uh, uh, I maintain that Jesus is also called the true God in 1 John chapter 5, verse 20, where we read after uh, the, the statement that we are in him who is tr true in his son Jesus Christ. John says, this one is the true God and eternal life. Now, the most natural antecedent of the pronoun this is to the person just mentioned, which would be Jesus Christ, but that isn't the only argument. In the context, this person who is called the true God is also called the eternal life. We know from 1 John chapter 1, verse 2, who that is. It's Jesus Christ. Okay, thank you. Okay, this one is for Greg. Questioner asks, <clears throat> explain what Jesus meant by I am he. 
Well, there are several texts in the um, New Testament, specifically the Gospel of John, where Jesus uses the words ego e me, which mean literally I am. He is implied as the predicate. You say I am something. That something is the predicate used to describe the I or the subject. And in every sense in which you look at it in the Gospel of John, you will find that there is, in fact, except for John 8.58, although possibly, there is an implied predicate. For example, in John 8.24, a text that Rob alluded to earlier in the debate, in relation to Isaiah, it clearly shows contextually that the predicate there, the he, if you will, is Messiah or son of man. Whereas, of course, in Isaiah, it's God. Two entirely different implied predicates based on the context, which Rob rightly pointed out is essential in understanding any text. So when Jesus uses the phrase, ego e me, or I am he, or I am, you need to simply look at the context. What is in question? What, what identity, what predicate? Are you the Christ? I am he. Okay, he there then relates to Christ. In John 9, 9, the question is posed to the blind man, you know, are you the one Jesus healed? He says, ego e me. I am the blind man whom Jesus healed. So that's all you need to do is look at the context to discern what the predicate is. In John 8, 58, it's a little different because the question there both has to do with how he saw Abraham and who he was, in my opinion, but it's a little bit more involved answer, and unless there's another question that specifically goes to that text, I'll refer to my uh, published writings on that subject. And as an addendum to the prior question, I would also add that, um, which I omitted earlier, that the worship that you would say Jesus has given in John 20, 28 or elsewhere isn't the kind of worship that only Almighty God would receive, hence he receives it. Okay, um, for Rob Bowman. <clears throat> How do Orthodox Christians justify their designating Jesus as, quote, God the Son, when such a designation or description never appears in the Bible. Why must we go beyond the language of Scripture to articulate our faith? Well, we all do that in various ways. Uh, we not only speak a different language than the languages that are represented in the text of the Bible, but we also uh, speak in different cultures that have different uh, categories of analysis and of, uh, and of uh, uh, thought. And the Greek uh, and Latin uh, Christians of the uh, early church uh, who had to wrestle with the biblical text themselves also had these different categories and different uh, philosophical backgrounds and terms. And the questions were unavoidable. The only issue was how were those questions to be answered. So we all use extra biblical language to describe our views. Uh, the expression God the Son uh, actually uses two biblical terms that are both used of Jesus Christ, God and the Son. Simply puts them together in a way that is not precisely found in the Bible, but of course both of these are true. Jesus is God and Jesus is the Son. That's all Trinitarians mean when they say that Jesus is God the Son. Uh, there is a close parallel to that phraseology in John 1.18, depending on how you understand the uh, statement that Jesus, a uh, description of Jesus as monogenes theos, only begotten God is how you probably find it translated uh, in the English Bible. Uh, the word monogenes uh, is actually in the context used not as an adjective, as a modifier of the noun theos, but earlier in verse 14 is used as a noun uh, in comparison with the Father. Jesus is uh, a monogenes in comparison to the Father and it appears to, likely that it's being used in the same way in verse 18. Monogenes basically means something like only son or only child. So what we have here in John 1.18 is someone who is called the only son, God, which is basically the same thing as calling him God the Son. Now there are various interpretations of John 1.18. There's also a textual problem. If this is a subject of interest to you, I recommend a book by Murray Harris called Jesus is God. Jesus as God, excuse me. Okay, for Greg, one of the ontologically defining attributes of Jehovah God is that he is eternal, the uncreated creator. However, John 1.3 clearly gives Jesus the same ontological status. He was not a quote-unquote made thing since he had to exist in order to make all things. How do you reconcile this attribute with your position? There are several ways. First, as I mentioned earlier, the context of John 1 is dealing with the physical creation. So you must contextually link the phrases and words there with what's being spoken about. 
And there it's talking about all the physical things that were ever made. And I've argued that in my books as well. But let's just say it's talking about more than that, because certainly Colossians 1 does. It talks about the things invisible and visible through which, which were made through Christ. The issue we're dealing with here is what is meant by all things and what is meant by creation. In my books, I show that all things typically refers to very specific things. For example, when it says in the Psalms that God placed all things under man's feet in Psalm 8. Does that mean everything was placed in subjection to man? Hardly. Certainly not the heavenly host, certainly not God himself, certainly not Christ. So it doesn't always mean all things. It means all things specific to the context in which something is being talked about. And I would argue that in John 1, 1 or John 1, the prologue, we're talking about the creation of all physical things in the beginning. In Colossians 1, we're talking about more, but we're dealing with all those things that were made through Christ, the through Christ things. So we need to be careful when we, when we take these descriptions that, that seem to be all-encompassing, all things, or even, as I said earlier, negative descriptions. There's no one else. Or when Jesus says, no one is good but the Father, when certainly we know Jesus is good as well, or no one is good but God, we've got to be careful that we don't take those too literally, because otherwise we're going to run into a whole host of other biblical problems. We need to look at things in context. Certainly your question, it's possible to understand it the way you have, but again, I would argue that it's also possible to understand it a different way, and that way is the way I just described. So as far as is eternality, it's not necessary to, to take from the descriptions made about Jesus' role in creation that he's eternal. In fact, I would argue that he's clearly not eternal based on what is uh, said of him elsewhere, that he is the firstborn of all creation, that he is the only begotten God, and other descriptions um, that are debatable, of course. Thank you. Okay, we have time for a few more. Um, Rob Bowman. Revela in Revelation 3.12, Christ calls Almighty God, my God, four times. If Christ is Almighty God, why does He have a being that is God to Him? All right, Revelation 3.12 and other scriptures that could also have been cited uh, Jesus does refer to the Father as his God. In John 20, verse 17, I think we have a paradigmatic statement that helps us to understand all of these statements uh, in a larger context. It's very curiously worded. If you look at John 20, verse 17, and I've, I'm not trying to play Bible ping pong here with you, but bear with me for a second. John 20, verse 17, uh, Jesus tells Mary Magdalene, to tell his brothers, I ascend to my Father and your Father, and to my God and my God and your God. This is a very clumsy way of saying what should have been more easily worded, you would think, to our Father and our God. Jesus doesn't do that, and I would submit the reason why is because the Father is his God by adoption, that is, by, by his voluntarily humbling himself to become a creature, to become a human being, whereas the Father is our God by nature, uh, because we are intrinsically creatures and that's all we ever will be. Was that the end of my time there? Uh, so uh, in Revelation 3.12, uh, remember I said that in my understanding of the biblical teaching, Jesus is still a human being. He still shares in our human created nature. And as such, he still does and forever will honor the Father as his God. Okay. Um, Greg. You seem to see no theological problem or difficulty in affirming Jehovah as deity and Jesus as deity. How can you escape the charge of being a polytheist? I don't int attempt to escape the charge. I simply attempt to describe what the Bible teaches. What labels people choose to give that resulting belief or teaching is up to them. If the Bible teaches that there's one almighty God and that there are others, who are existing in the heavenly realm who are also considered gods in some sense, I simply accept it. I don't try to figure out whether or not the resulting teaching is in somehow conflict with a, a pejorative type teaching such as a, a teaching like polytheism, which is a term that's thrown out in a pejorative sense. If the Bible teaches that there's more than one God in some sense, but only one God in the ultimate sense, I don't necessarily think that's polytheism. Perhaps henotheism or some other similar type of theism but the point is, what does the Bible teach? If the Bible teaches it, are you willing to accept it, even if it's polytheism? Okay, this one is for Rob Bowman. 
Um, you said Jesus humbled himself to become one of us, insinuating that he gave up his divine nature, at least during the incarnation. Uh, I apologize that that impression was given. That's not my view. My view is that Jesus is God and man at the same time, and that he has been since the conception of Jesus in the womb of the Virgin Mary. Uh, what I uh, am, was saying when Jesus humbled himself to become one of us was not that he stopped being who he was as well, but that he combined uh, not only two roles, but two natures, to use the classical theological language. Uh, Jesus was God and man, uh, and he still is. Colossians 2.9 says that the fullness of the divine being, or the divine nature, dwells, dwells present tense in him in bodily form. Uh, Jesus is God in a body. Uh, Jesus is God in human form. Uh, so the, the understanding that I have of Philippians 2 and uh, Colossians 2 and other passages is that Jesus is both God and man simultaneously. Now, that's still a humbling because in his uh, human existence, particularly his horse, historical existence before the resurrection, uh, Jesus uh, allowed his humanity to veil his divinity, his deity. You couldn't tell by looking at him that he was God. He didn't have a halo, you know. Uh, there was one occasion when light started pouring out of him, out of every pore apparently, in the transfiguration, which was giving the disciples a glimpse of what they were really looking at. But generally speaking, you couldn't tell it was God. Uh, but yet Jesus could say to his disciples, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Uh, again, uh, that's a paradox, but it's the, what the Bible actually teaches. Okay, uh, this one is for Greg. Um, okay, the questioner is asking in relation to biblical passages such as Revelation 1.8, Revelation 19.6 that refer to the Alpha and the Omega. Uh, and what the question is getting at is since the terms Alpha and Omega apply to Almighty God, but then these terms are also applied to Jesus, does that not create a difficulty for your position that denies that Jesus is Almighty God? No, the question assumes that those titles are applied to Jesus. I deny that. And I presented a, an, a lengthy section that explains just why that is the case. It's true Jesus is called the first and the last in the beginning and the end, but it's interesting. Oh, not the beginning, I'm sorry. He is called the first and the last in Revelation. Uh, 1 8, I believe, and chapter 2, somewhere in the opening part of chapter 2. But in neither of those instances is he also called beginning and the end and Alpha and the Omega. The, those titles are elsewhere applied to God. Now, some of you may find this interesting, but it's very important that when you read Revelation this way, you follow who's talking. Because often you're talking, who's talking is an angel speaking for God, for Christ, and for others, for himself, I should say. You will find that when the personal pronoun I is used, that the angel is often, again, speaking for other persons. And if you follow the same logic that would lead you to conclude that Jesus is called the Alpha and the Omega in Revelation, you will find a problem because you're also going to have John being called the Alpha and the Omega. I believe it's in Revelation chapter 21. There are several texts here that come into play. And if the questioner should approach me afterward, and I'll give you a copy, I'll get you a copy of my discussion of this because you have to look at every single passage look at who's talking, whether it's Christ, God, or an angel, and figure out who the referent is. You will also find that um, it's interesting that one text, I believe it's Revelation 1.11, was added to the um, manuscripts that, were, that formed the basis of the translation of the King James Version that is the only explicit reference to Jesus calling himself the Alpha and the Omega. But again, I can test the fact that Jesus is ever called Alpha and the Omega, and I think if you follow the, the narrative in the book of Revelation that you'll find that he is, in fact, never explicitly called or calling himself the Alpha and the Omega. However, he does call himself the first and the last. There's also a, a manuscript variation there in the Alexandrian manuscript that says first and first born and last. And of course, the book of Revelation has a, a, a very intricate and complicated manuscript history to begin with. So there's a lot of issues. I think you should read my published discussion of that to get all the answers from my perspective. Thank you. Okay. Um, um, I'm going to uh, direct this one to uh, Rob Bowman. Um, and uh, since uh, Greg Stafford began, um, we'll conclude this one with uh, Rob. Um, the questioner here asks, in 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 28, 
would you explain how the Son subjects himself to the Father when they are both in heaven? Uh, this question is similar to uh, an earlier one uh, regarding uh, how can the Father be Jesus God if Jesus is God in heaven because Jesus isn't just God in heaven, he is God and man and as uh, the head of the new creation, the head of the new humanity that's redeemed uh, through their faith in Jesus Christ, through their spiritual union with Jesus Christ, uh, he on behalf of all of us and leading us uh, in, in so doing uh, submits to the Father as God and honors him in that way. So that is, that is Jesus' mediatorial role coming to a climax in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 24 to 28. It is in no way inconsistent with the orthodox view. In fact, it is demanded by the orthodox theology that Jesus is God and man. In other words, look at it this way. Uh, what we often are being uh, given here is, well, gee, this looks like a problem. But then it turns out it's exactly what the orthodox doctrines of the Trinity and the Incarnation predict you would find in Scripture if they're true. Well, then they can't really be problems. If it's true that Jesus is God and man, that he is both divine and human, and has those two natures united in himself, and will forever be the God-man, then you would expect, as the head of the new humanity, that the Son, Jesus, would submit himself to the Father forever. And that's, in fact, exactly what you find in Scripture. It's not counter to what you'd expect. It is exactly what you pre would predict. So if you simply treat the orthodox position as a hypothesis to be tested by the evidence of Scripture, the doctrine of the Incarnation comes out quite nicely. Uh, each debater is going to have five minutes to make uh, closing remarks. And um, Greg is uh, going to go first, and then uh, Rob Bowman is going to go second. Uh, now, the purpose of the closing remarks is to give the debaters an opportunity now, having um, presented their affirmative case, uh, having uh, discussed uh, the rebuttals, and also now having fielded a small sampling of questions at least, to kind of summarize, uh, address whether uh, they feel the issues have been um, dealt with here, maybe what issues are still remaining, or anything they would like to bring by way of a closure and summary to uh, what has been said this evening. So um, we're going to uh, start with Greg. And we have five minutes. Is Jesus God? Is Jesus the Alpha and the Omega? Is Jesus Jehovah? Who is Jesus? I can answer in the affirmative to those first three questions because none of them contradict my view. My view is derived from the scriptures in terms of speaking about Jesus and applying to him the phrases and titles that the Bible gives him. You heard just a moment ago that I rejected the fact that Jesus is called the Alpha and the Omega, yet I can accept it because it's not a problem. What is a problem is that when we apply phrases and descriptions to persons in the Bible and pour into it certain meanings that are not conceptually articulated in the scriptures, that's a problem. If we let the Bible speak and we give the titles their normal meaning, what do we see? Well, is Jesus God? We've already talked about how in the scriptures we could say in the pattern, in, in terms of being patterned after the Old Testament description of angels and other spiritual beings, that he is God. We can address him as God, as Thomas did, in a representative and authoritative capacity. He is also a divine being, spiritual, copied after God's own essence. There's no one next to God who you could call God more than Jesus. Is Jesus Jehovah? I could also affirm that question. Because even in the Old Testament period, or I should say the intertestamental period, there is literature where, Jewish literature, where spiritual beings like Metatron and others are in fact given the divine name. What do we find in the New Testament? Jesus is given the name above all other names. That name is more than likely Jehovah. But he's given the name. You can't give Jehovah his own name, but he can give it to someone else to act in his capacity. And there's no one who would be more deserving or who would be, to whom it would be more appropriate to have that name than Jesus Christ. Is Jesus the Alpha and the Omega? Is Jesus Lord? The same answer applies. In whatever sense the Bible wants to give those terms to Jesus, he is deserving. But he is not a person of God. He is God in a sense that the Bible allows him to be God by being a distinct individual from his father, a distinct being, his own individual unique deity. This is all articulated in the scriptures. I don't need to borrow language from out, some outside and later source to explain it. It's right there. He's called Theos. I accept it. I don't need to explain beyond simply acknowledging that 
his relation to other beings called Theos. I don't need to explain what it means in terms of him being a person of Theos. He's Theos, El, Greek and Hebrew words for God. He's given the divine name. But what, how does that tell us, what does that tell us about his role in God's purpose or who he actually is? I contend it does not tell us that he's God, equal to the Father, eternal, part of a trinity, deny that completely. I find no articulation in the scriptures for any of that. But I do find that the Bible applies divine terms to Jesus, that he does have within him the fullness of that which makes one a God or a divinity. And it does dwell bodily, by the way. But bodily does not necessarily mean physically. The angels have spiritual bodies. Paul talks about it in an entire chapter in 1 Corinthians 15 about how many bodies there are. I don't believe angels are bodiless or that spiritual beings are bodiless, so it's entirely appropriate that all the fullness of deity dwells bodily in Jesus. And he expresses that perfectly. He's the perfect representation of God. That is why God entrusts him with so much. That is why he's the Messiah, the king, who's going to ultimately destroy all the wickedness that Satan and sinful mankind has brought about on the earth. Jesus Christ is the only begotten God. He was with God in the beginning before any physical creation was made. When the angels cried out joyfully, as Job 38, 7 tells us, Jesus was there, not just there, but a participant in the creative order. Jesus is God's only begotten Son. He's not just a Son of God. There are many sons of God in heaven, as the Bible tells us. They all met in council when Satan entered in among them and challenged God to his face. Jesus was there. But as the Son of God, he is distinct from God. He's not equal to his Father. According to his own words, the Father is greater than he is, not just greater than his physical nature. This idea of a Dual nature is, again, something that we do not find articulated in the scriptures. And if the Orthodox predicted it, I have to give them credit. I actually believe that they originated it to deal with problems in the scriptures. They didn't anticipate, they didn't predict that there would be these problems. They saw the problems, and they created a solution. And that solution is not articulated in the scriptures. One of the questions earlier had to do with polytheism. And that word itself just seems to create a, a rise out of any Christian because we're taught that that's just not scriptural. But no one says you have to use that term and no one says that that's in fact what the scriptures teach. I said if it teaches that, would you accept it? In other words, are your beliefs priority over scripture or is scripture priority over your beliefs? It's a question all of us need to consider and reflect on significantly. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. It's Oh, hold on a second. I'll try sure. to mess this up. Well, I want to thank Greg for coming and for uh, the uh, uh, cordial and enjoyable discourse that we've had for the past couple of hours. I hope that you will look on this as uh, either the beginning of a discussion, if this is your first uh, heavy-duty entrance into it, or the continuation of a discussion and you won't go out this door and say, well, that was interesting, now let's move on to something else, but that you will see this as something that's whetted your appetite to get into the scriptures in a very deep way and study these things for yourself. I'd like to make just a couple of closing remarks uh, regarding uh, the issues here. First, uh, a comment about Greg's position, and then a uh, comment and a closing uh, observation regarding mine. I think that it has to be said at this point that there's a very real sense in which Greg's position comes dangerously close to being non-falsifiable. That is to say, uh, Greg can look, could look at a scripture hypothetically that said, uh, Jesus is God, Jesus is Jehovah God, Jesus is God Almighty, Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, etc., etc., and he could say that's all true and fine and dandy as long as it's taken in a representative sense. Uh, so that he can finesse all of these types of statements, no matter what they might be, uh, as simply uh, not being a problem for his position. But the cost is that his position becomes non-falsifiable. That is, there's no way to show, uh, uh, there's no statement that you can imagine the Bible making virtually within its own category of language, of course, that would satisfy him that, in fact, Jesus really is Jehovah God. And I think that's a serious problem for the position that he's uh, uh, carved out. He's even admitted that it's very likely that in Philippians 2, verses 9 to 11, the name that is above every name that is bestowed on Jesus when he's highly exalted is the name Jehovah. Uh, now, that's a, a, a surprising admission, uh, but again, it's consistent with the uh, non-falsifiable position that he's staked out. 
Uh, the problem is, is that he assumes that if, he's if the name is bestowed, it's bestowed for the very first time. That is a, a clear mistake biblically because there are many instances, specifically with regard to Jesus, where Jesus is said to be designated something or made something or declared to be something at a point in time when we know very well that he already was. For example, in Romans 1 verse 4, we are told that Jesus was declared with power to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. But we, we know he already was. In Acts 2.36, Peter says that Jesus has been made both Lord and Christ. But we know he already was the Christ uh, when he was a human being before, a uh, mortal human being before his death and resurrection. So I think that Greg's position is not only non, it's in, it all gets close to being non-falsifiable, but if you look very closely, there are some serious problems, at least you can poke some holes to look at and think about. Now about my position, I want us to uh, uh, observe, uh, again, reiterate and amplify a little bit of what do I mean when I say that Jesus is God. Uh, now, <clears throat> the bottom line here is I mean two things, essentially, that are, for me, the heart and soul of the Christian faith in Jesus Christ. The first is that Jesus does what God does. That is, he does them for me. And so he's my God because he does them for me. He is my maker. He made heaven and earth and he made me. I owe my existence to him. If you carefully analyze the Jehovah's Witness doctrine, by the way, of creation, an interesting question to ask is who formed Adam from the dust of the ground? I would submit that since they believe that Jehovah God made only Jesus directly and then assigned Jesus the task of making everything else, they would have to say that Jesus made the first man. So even in their theology, in some sense, Jesus is our maker. Well, that makes him my God, biblically, because the one who made heaven and earth and all things in it is, by definition, the Lord God. He is also our savior and our judge. The Father has assigned Jesus the task of judging all of us, and specifically in virtue not simply of his deity, but in virtue also of his humanity. And John 5, verse 26 says, in fact, that he's been given this assignment because he is the Son of Man. So it's Jesus as the God-man, not simply as God or as a divine being who is assigned this job of judging us. So first of all then, Jesus is God because he does for me what God does. Secondly, Jesus is God because I am to respond to him the way the Bible tells me to respond to God. And we already talked about that, that we are to honor Jesus, the Son, just as we honor the Father, John 5, verse 23. That we are to call upon Jesus on the name of the Lord Jesus for salvation something that the Old Testament tells us to do in relationship to Jehovah God. Cross-reference, if you will, Joel 2, verse 32, with Romans 10, verse 13 in context. We are to worship Jesus Christ. In fact, the angels do so uh, according to the Bible. We are to fear Christ in the same sense as we are to fear the Lord. We are to ask Jesus for things. And we're talking about asking a heavenly being for things, not asking your neighbor or your friend. And finally, we are to give glory to Jesus in doxological praise, just as we find given to uh, God himself. For example, in 2 Peter 3, 18, the very last verse uh, says, Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. That's responding to Jesus as if he were God. Thank you very much.